Ah, oh, welcome, folks. Midday here, and oh man, dude, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. And joined today by a mentor for me in many ways, motivational speaker and amazing drummer Dom Fumilaro. Welcome back to the Jake Feinberg Show. Thanks, Jake. Thanks so much. Great to be here, guys. Hello, hello, hello. Everybody tuning in. Keep the comments coming in. And um, you know, I uh, you mentioned something, and I really want you to vet this because your live playing career is always kind of mercurial for me. 1976. Yeah. You leave the jingle scene of New York. You leave this wherever you were marinating yeah, in, yeah. and you had a band that you took out or that you were part of. They went to L.A. Well, who was in the band? What was the band about, and why did you move? Great guys. First of all, the, uh, well, the keyboard player was Frank Goldstein, who is now living up in the Bay Area. And he worked with many, many different artists up in the Bay Area, booked bands, played up there, and still is very actively playing up there. Frank is just a monster. He, one of these keyboard players that can play any tune in any key. Yeah. Any Idio Cervantes kind of, yeah. Any style. So we would pull, you know, we'd go from like some Latin stuff to some bebop stuff to some contemporary rock stuff to like some Sinatra. We, we, because the band had that kind of a wide scope of going anywhere, <clears throat> Frank was just a great guy to have on keyboard. The bass player and vocalist was Tony Opetison. This guy is <laughs> another phenomenal musician. Great guitar player, great bass player, great singer. And he was a Sinatra, you know, aficionado. He knew every song by Sinatra, had a range of the sound like Sinatra. So he just, we would, if anybody requested at that time in 1976, we're playing at the Queensway Hilton Hotel in California. We leave New York, it was January, and we realized it the weather and dragging your stuff through New York. And there was no cartage at that, there was no cartage. No cartage, then you're dragging the stuff on your own, man. So we were playing a gig in, in, in uh, late to January, and I said, uh, as we're playing the gig, we're playing it. Places packed, we're not tuxedos, we're doing it. And I said, uh, hey guys, how about we go to California? I, I want to study with Shelly Mann. How about we go to California and get out of this crazy weather? So Frank's playing, and Frank says, great, I'm in. Tony turns on bass and says, I'm good, let's go. So Tony says, well, when do you want to leave? So this was a Sunday night. It's a trio, though. It's a trio. It's just a trio. So I said, um, it's a Sunday night. I said, how about Tuesday? They said, great, we'll leave Tuesday. And that's kind of how flippant we were about life. Great, so we finished the gig, packed up our stuff. Monday we got together to meet how we're going to work this out. We took my van, we took Frank's Datsun 240Z, we followed each other, and we drove, we packed this up, and we drove from New York to California. No gig, no place to stay, we have no idea what we're going to do, but on my mind was, I got to sit down with Shelly Mann. I had studied with Morello and Chapin and some great, great players, Max Roach, I had a couple of lessons with Elvin Jones, Papa Joe Jones, and I, so I, the East Coast thing I understood, and they kept on saying, you got to sit down with Shelly. So I make the drive out to the coast, and we get this job, we do an audition, we get this job at the Queensway Hilton Hotel, which was in uh, Long Beach, California, and they book us for six nights a week, and each night we did like a different, because of the band that we had, eventually a saxophone player, Richie Scolo, came out and joined us. This band could play anything, so we'd have like one night was Sinatra night. Now at that time in 76, you know, Sinatra was still huge, the main event, and he came back out of his retirement. People would come out and request Sinatra because Tony knew every song that Sinatra, you know, had done out of his book, and Frank could play any song. They would give us requests. We'd play songs like like Ghost of a Chance. <laughs> Who the hell knows Ghost of a Chance? A woman comes up with a hundred dollar bill and says, "Can you play Sinatra's Ghost of a Chance?" Tony says, "Great." Tony takes the money. We put it in the tip bar. Tony to Frank and says, "E flat." Ghost of a chance. Da 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 da. Tony singing this. I just grabbed some brushes. I listened. We did it. We played this thing. And the woman went crazy. So that's how the band worked. We were able to do anything and we worked. So that became our Sinatra night. We had a jazz night. We had a Latin night. We had a, a, a dance night. The weekend was, of course, you know, contemporary you know, music at that time. So it really was, it was an exciting band that we, we just, and we worked there for a year, six nights a week. Fantastic gig. While out there, I then go to the Dick Grove Music School to study, because that's where Shelley taught there. I go there on a Saturday morning. <laughs> I go to sit down with Shelley Mann, and I was just so excited. And I said, you know, when I called him up on the phone, 
I said, Mr. Man, my name is Don Famularo. I want to come out and schedule some lessons with you. He says, yeah, I spoke to Morello. He spoke to me and he said you were going to come out, so right. I made it out here. So they, they talked between themselves. And we sat down, and that became a whole other adventure of stepping into the life of Shelly Mann, which was just, this guy was just so deep at so many levels. Can you, uh, just for the audience, because pe people are having a ball, I, I, this Kojak session. Well, you can, you, can you flash to that? Because I, I think this is, Joe Porcaro was there, and I want you to break this down. Now, just this is the, the genius of Shelly Mann. 76, you know, the, 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 this was around that time. And I went back, the, the, he was, he not only had his own club called the Manhole, so he was doing some deep jazz stuff, and he had many great artists that were there. But he also, he played with Stan Kenton, so he had artistry and rhythm, all this big band stuff, Shelly. Shelly was also starred as the role of Davy Tuck in the Gene Krupa movie. So if you ever watch the Gene Krupa movie, and it's available probably even on YouTube, and it's a phenomenal movie about Gene Krupa, the drummer. It's a bit Hollywood the way the movie is done, but Gene, one of Gene's best friends was Davy Tuck. Shelly Mann played the part of Davy Tuck. So in the movie, he was a movie star. He had recording now TV shows and movies. He was playing the drum track to it. So now he's, he's doing this Kojak show. Kojak was, a, was a, like a, I think it was a New York detective that sucked on a lollipop and, and Telly Savalas, the bald, bald guy. guy. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Cop. It was a real, a real good. Total mid 70s uh, yeah, good cop kind of thing. Good kind of a you know, cop show that was one of the early cop shows. So Shelly would play the track to it. So I happened to be out in California at the time and uh, Shelly invited me to one of these sessions at Universal Studios. And there was a big you know, kind of a glass room where the drums were. And uh, we go in there and it's a full orchestra. It's this like, you know, it's this like strings and, and, and brass and trombones and everything, full percussion section, Joe Picaro's on the gig playing percussion, but I think Emil Richards was also on the gig. Emil, Joe, Emil. The, uh, the legend. So this is like the team about there, and I'm like this little, you know, you know punk kid just, just, you know, in awe of all of this here. They come out and they give the book to Shelley. It's this thick book of music stuff for this session. Now, this way the session works. How thick was the book? I, I would say probably about two to three inches <laughs> thick okay, like this, of, of, of sheet music. Yeah. With it. So we come in, so I'm going, oh, man, these guys are doing it. And I think it was a, a, a special two-hour show that they were doing for Kojak. And the way it worked was there was a huge, like, IMAX screen in back of the orchestra that the conductor faced to watch the screen. And then the orchestra was here. They all faced the conductor. And on the screen, what they do in the movie theaters, where they, in the movie uh, system, there's a, a, a line that goes across the screen for the tempo of that piece. So in that scene, this line comes out, and they give you eight up front, and all of a sudden you see one, two, three, the lines are four, five, six, seven, eight, and they begin this process, and he, he, the conductor conducts it to that tempo that he set for that piece of music that was composed for that scene. So this, I'm watching this, and this production is like intense, and everyone's playing their parts, and it's beautiful. Shelley opens a book, puts it on the stand, and then starts talking to me. So I said, um, it, uh, he just told me, he said, Don, what we do here now, you got Joe over there, and we got this session here, and they're going to record <laughs> this, and then after we record each section, the production company up in the booth listens to it, if they like it, they give us thumbs up, then we go to the next section, and he's explaining to me what's going on. So I said, Shelley, I, I don't want to, I don't want to interrupt you from working, but don't you want to look at the music? He goes, No, nah, not really. <laughs> he was just such a great jazz cat. I said, I said, What do you mean, not really? He says, Well, because I'm going to play what I feel is best for the part. When I once I see the music, I'll know how to adapt what I feel is needed for the music. That is, I mean, I ex, now explain what he said. He goes, Not really, because. And I don't want to, to bag on the composer, sure. but, but he was talking about this aesthetic, the Nelson Riddle aesthetic or the other cast that he's worked with in the past, the, the Bill Holmans. Uh, he said they didn't really know. Sometimes This is fascinating stuff. Sometimes the younger composers didn't totally have the, the sensibility to be able to create the feel that was really needed on that screen. So Shelley was such a compassionate and sensitive person. He would, he would like look at the music and if he felt it was a little bit too elementary for what was needed, he would change the part to play something more dramatic. Or maybe even change the dynamic of what he was seeing because he felt it was needed. So he'd look at the scene, kind of feel what it is, and he played what he felt. That's like in real time sensitivity and compassion, knowing your craft so well and being able to predict and feel. This is what comes back from just the experience these guys had. So when I go back and speak about wisdom, which is what I felt Shelley really owned, you know, in, in tempo, wisdom is a combination of knowledge and experience. 
Ex- you know, knowledge alone does not give somebody wisdom. I, listen, I've got friends of mine who have, who have knowledge beyond... You can't get out of a paper bag sometimes. They can't tie their shoes. Right. Okay, so so it, it, it's a... But their knowledge is brilliant. Experience is when you take that knowledge and put it into action. Once you put that experience, in the, that knowledge into action, experience now gives you the knowing how to... The realization. Adapt. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. This is unreal. Shelley had this incredible experience. He had incredible knowledge about drumming because when we took lessons about... Gladstone and playing and brushes and just understanding. He was just so deep, aside from the fact that he was an extremely humorous person at many, many levels. Well, and also, let's be clear. The, the best part of that story is that he, the, uh, well, this might have been something different with Pork. I want you to tell the Jeff Pork Carroll okay, story that because that one's the best one. That's yeah. the that's the Shelly Man story that's of a, all time. That's a deep, well, again, these guys are so deep. These stories are classic and great because they were classic and great because they had such knowledge and such expertise. So the Kojak story finishes where he plays this entire piece, does the whole thing, closes the book, hands the book back, all everything in one take. And interesting enough is that the room that Shelley recorded in for a lot of those sessions with Shelley Philly, they dedicated that room to Shelley Mann. So when I went back to that room... The Shelley Mann booth, that's it's right. The Shelley Mann booth. So when you go back there, that's owned by Shelley Mann and several other great artists, like Willie Ornelas. I witnessed Willie Ornelas. Willie, he's tuning in. Willie, he's the Willie, legendary Willie cat. Willie is... A phenomenal, phenomenal legend. Shaman drummer. And I witnessed Willie. Willie uh, uh, did a session. Uh, it was a uh, Tom Selleck two-parter session that Willie recorded. And I was there. Tom Post, I believe, was the musician. Oh, Mike Post was Mike the Mike Post, Selleck. That's was unreal. Unbelievable. And Willie cut through that music again flawlessly in what he did. So to witness these guys do this at such an incredible level really is pretty magical at a high level. Willie is a very important person to get to know and understand. I've, I've done, I've caught a hang because uh, Tony Brownagle, again, we're still waiting on that shuffle book, but he he, yeah. he, he hit me to Willie. Dear friend. But, yeah, but yeah. The, here's this idea is that do you, do you think, before we get into the Jeff Porcaro story, do you feel that there are cats today, even though people can get the perfect bass drum sound and the perfect miking techniques, People are unable to detect that it feels right. They want to get they, they want to get it done and put it in the in the hopper, get it in the can, as opposed to doing something. The story you're about to tell about Jeff and Shelley speaks to the fact that in today's world, I can see my generation, somebody like Shelley and someone in that class, Dom, let's say Dom, standing up, basically cracking a joke and 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 putting everybody at ease. Mm. But someone's saying, what the hell is he doing? That was a burning, that was a great take. What, what the hell is he, to me, are people more hung up on perfection now than feel? Well, uh, interesting. I, I, I think feel always wins. Feel always wins. <laughs> it always wins. Always wins. Because if perfection is achieved and it sacrifices feel, it's not perfection. Perfection for me is, can I display the emotion through my instrument and move people. That's always the final goal, to serve the song. Am I moving people and lifting them up through the music? And even if the tempo is not perfect, listen, there are many great artists. Buddy Rich, at times I went to him play, he didn't have exact I love it, slow ups, speed ups. He he pushed the band for what he felt the audience, and he pushed it on a faster part, pulled it back. He he ran that. If we would have put that on 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 a gauge, or, or to try to quantize it, it would have ruined the feeling of what was happening. And that's exactly what I, it was. I love this though. Okay. Buddy was a genius about that. He, he knew he knew people and knew how to emotionally connect with them. That's to me what what the value of music, and that's what Shelley had at a high level. Shelley, having played with all this experience and all these live performances, big bands and small groups, his own club, the television stuff, the movie stuff, this guy. Teaching this guy did it all. Well, riff on that poor Carol story because so, it encapsulates man's this, unpro- you know this sort of uncanny Zen this mastery. Was, this was told me by Jeff Porcaro. Jeff had hired Shelley. They were doing a, a, a full orchestra event for a pop artist. I don't remember who the artist was, but Jeff um, had said he wanted Shelley. They wanted two drummers. Jeff was going to lay down more of the pocket for the groove, and he wanted Shelley to kind of color a little bit more of a looser you know, jazzier uh, on top of that pocket. Make it feel good. Absolutely. So Jeff calls them. Shelly, they come down, they do it. Now, Shelly at the time was about 62, 63 years old. He died at 64. So here he is at this point of his career where he's done everything in his life. He's done everything and still working, still doing it all. So they're doing the date, and 
as they're playing this full symphony that's playing with strings and they're there and they had like background chorus singing with you know singers singing and, and they're doing this thing and they're playing the part about halfway through the piece <laughs> as they're recording this take there's a Shelly man puts his sticks down and, goes, and stands up and says wait wait everybody stop 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 you gotta hold it a second guy wait wait so everyone stops the producer they stop the tape they stop the conductor everyone now strings and of course they all turn around to look at Shelly and Shelly's standing, wait, wait, stop, 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 stop. And Jeff is like, doesn't know where this is going to go. Shelly goes, I can't believe I'm having this much fun on my way down. <laughs> the place loses it. Jeff said we laughed for like 15 minutes, just howling, the conductor, everyone just laughed. After they all left, they played the track again, and that was the take. It worked out perfectly well. He broke that he could feel that it was, there was no, there, the feel wasn't there. The feel wasn't there and he could sense that everybody was kind of trying as opposed to doing. You know, there's, there's, there's being in the moment. And I think what Shelley had was the, the, one of the greatest things, how to be in the moment. See, a person that has many regrets in their life lives in the past. They regret what they said, they regret what they did. They're living in the past by constantly bringing that back up. They're living at that, what they They did. can't let it go. They can't yeah. let it go. So they're living in that past. Right. A person who is anxious or worried about what will happen is living in the future. They're worried about what hasn't happened Projection, yet, yeah. But they're worried about it, so they're spending energy to worry about it, and it hasn't even happened yet. A person that really is at peace with themselves is a person living in the now. Shelley had that. He was in the moment, and he felt at that moment it just wasn't connecting in jelly. So he needed laughter to relax everyone. They went back and played this session. When the session was over and they ended it, everyone paused for a second. The producer came on and said, that was perfect. He said, Shelly, thank you so much. That's the power of greatness. That's the power of being concerned about serving the soul. That's the power of making people feel good. It's also an awareness and an, and a, and an understanding of true feel. Knowing that something is stiff, that something is too uptight, having to do something a little bit unorthodox, yeah. and not really worrying about it, and, and, and getting up there and breaking, breaking the tension, yeah. and then all of a sudden burning. I, last time I caught you, we, we were on such a stream of consciousness the last time, two years ago I was with Dom. I, can you play the, the short and inbred melody? The, because you were talking about was the first tune that you really heard Morello it doing. Morello play, yeah. It was short and inbred. He was playing melodically, or any tune, just yeah, play I the... Yeah. I, I don't have my drums tuned the way that Merle has You do tuned. what you want to do. I'm just saying, I, I really want yeah. you to play melodically on the kit, to play the tune. What happened here is that I have my drums set up with a 12, 10, 16, 14. And they're tuned where I have this. But if I play 14, 16, 10, 12... be do dee da I now start to begin this melodic way of playing. So by reversing the toms and by tuning my drums in fourths the way they are, wow. it allows me to have, a ch I challenge myself musically. So if I want to play a fill high to low, I have to play. I've got to change my direction to get that sound. If I play the fill normally how I would play. The, the, the sound of the tone of where that fill would be. So this groove, that becomes kind of melodic.
Jeez, my God. I mean, Morello, what was in, I mean, just for younger cats that are going to watch this down the road, I mean, aside from Shortening, bro, which I was checking out because we never got through that stream of consciousness, yeah. what, what are some of the other tunes that when you were just young, where you really heard the drummer, it, where it wasn't in the back of the bus, just keep time, shut yeah. up, it was melody? You know, it, it, it kind of, I always go back, it kind of started with Gene. Gene had, um, right, had used two 16 floor toms. And, and, and the times, and, and he would think about even like like Caravan or Sing Sing Sing, that floor tom jungle groove kind of complemented the melody of how it was written. Sing Sing Sing, I believe, was written by Louis Prima. And Louis You're absolutely Prima, right. Who was an absolutely phenomenal. His drummer. drummer's great. I think his drummer's still around, too. His drummer is Bobby Morris. Thank yes. Who is still around, who just wrote a book. Called My Las Vegas. I have. I need to I catch a hang with that cat, man. What a legend! Bobby Morris is is a legend's legend. Did Bobby make that tune? Sing, sing, sing. He, he? Um, well, Bobby played that song with with Louis Prima. But what Bobby did with Louis Prima when Louis Prima was playing the drummer before was playing a shuffle, and the shuffle pattern. Right. You mentioned about Tony Brown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tony Brown. Yeah, Tony's tuning in, so it'd be good. To, yeah. right? and, and Tony, who was a brilliant musician, badass. Before, who was a fantastic artist at many levels. Wannabe actor, but a great drummer. What, I'll tell you something. <laughs> yeah. More than a wannabe actor. Great actor. Several things that he did. That yeah, I know. I love him, dude. I love that guy, so, man. So that, that shuffle feel that a lot of players were playing, they were playing the Louis Prima fast shuffle like this here. Just the gigolo. A little, yeah. That, that feel. Because they didn't have the chops. Bobby Morris came along and started putting that in his left hand. shuffle. Bobby Morris had the chops to do that. So when he started doing that, when he first joined Louis Prima's band, he said, you know, I think, Mr. Prima, I think if you have the shuffle in the left hand, it's going to push the feel more. When Louis Prima heard that, he said, I want you in my band. I don't care what it costs. So that Bobby Morris sound of that shuffle opened up a whole nother level of having the skill and the technique to play that. Bobby's story, as a young child from Poland, moving into New York and then moving out to Las Vegas in the 50s and then playing in the 50s with the greatest artist that you can imagine. He was he a was, um, musical director for Elvis for many years, played with Sinatra, played with Barbra Streisand, played with all the great Judy Garland, you name it. The book is amazing because he's got pictures in there of all these different people. This guy has a life that is so enriched with stories and the history of you know, modern music at such a high level. I gotta connect you with him so you can talk to him about that book for sure. Uh, you know, I know we went. I'm gonna, we can break down the decades later, but I wanted you to talk a little bit about. Um, I, I caught a hang with John Molo yesterday up mm. in um, up in Port Chester, and he yeah. was he was talking about. Um, <clears throat> well, a lot of people were just talking about jungle drums. The the, the Krupa's work with with Benny Goodman. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what was it about Krupa that truly was revolutionary as it related to what well, we talked about the roaring 20s we talked about dixieland all the, the things mo leading up to it was it just that he that he basically played uh to the point where he stretched it to where you you know you didn't want to break the rules but he pushed it all the way to the limit i mean what was croup is what's his legacy because i feel like that was the beginning of individual drumming I think one of the key things about Gene, and and believe it or not, I had the chance to talk to Gene briefly on the phone in the early 70s. He died in 1973. Wow. I was taking lessons with Joe Morello at this Dawn and Kirshner studio in New Jersey. Joe was dear friends with Gene. One day Gene called up Joe during our lesson, and I, you know, he's, I didn't know who he was talking to, and, it, and Joe was just talking and saying, well, I'm in a lesson right now. And Gene said, oh, really? He said, and, and he told Joe, put me on with the student. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm like, you know, I'm like, as, as green as you can imagine as a young kid. And I get the phone and, and I said, yes, so he goes, and he goes, what's your name? I said, my name is, is Dominic. He said, this is Gene Krupa. And I want you to know that if you're studying with Joe Morello, you're on the right path of what you're going to learn and opening your mind. And his voice was just so kind. And it was like he was hugging me with these words. And it was just so, you know, positive. But good luck, man. Keep it going. And I hope someday to meet you. So I, I said, boy, Mr. Cooper, thank you, thank you so much. I was probably stammering like, like, a, like, a, like a child. I gave the phone back to Joe. They finished the conversation. We got back to our lesson. And then I found out from Joe, yeah, Gene's playing on Long Island. 
So in a few weeks, Jim was playing at a, at a, literally at the Oceanside Park, which is, I lived in Baldwin. That was, was right next, Nassau County, yeah. Right next to Oceanside was this park right near where, where I lived. I then get 104 fever on that day. I am burning up. I get up at like six o'clock, I'm putting my pants on, and my mom says to me, where are you going? I said, I, I gotta go see Gene, he's playing at the park. She's like, you're about a two degrees away from dying. Yeah, my mother said, you can't, you're not even making sense what you're saying. Right. You know? She goes, you can't go, you gotta get back in bed. So I got back in bed, she gave me some chicken soup, and thank you very much, I was gone, but I miss Gene. And then just literally, you know, several, several, um, you know, probably several months afterwards, he passed away in 73. So I missed meeting Gene. But what Gene did was, he was a student of Sanford Moeller, he also was a student of George Lawrence Stone and of Billy Gladstone. So Gladstone, who had this finger technique, which taught Shelly Mann. George Lawrence Stone, who had this wrist and rebound technique that taught Morello, Morello's best student. And then Sanford Moeller, who taught Jim Chapin. Mm. As the story goes, it was Gene Krupa that recommended Moeller to Jim Chapin. So Jim wanted to learn, saw Krupa play, asked him, you know, you know, I want to take lessons. He said, let me give you the number of my teacher. So Krupa was an avid student of learning. I think that's an important part of the, the process of how you, how you change you know, people's attitude and minds. If you continue being a student, you are relevant always at that time. Shelley was like that, too. Shelley was, was, was the leader of that. Are you like that today, too? Absolutely, man. I, Can you I, give an example of how you, you still well, keep I mean, that student in you? There are many players that come to me for lessons. Uh, I just had Daniel Adair in the studio. Daniel Adair is a drummer with Nickelback. He came down here, flew in from Vancouver, we sat and we talked, and I wanted to hear, I asked him, who are you listening to, what are you doing, we played, and I just saw some, some real creative playing in Daniel's playing, and it was so great. So to me, that's me staying relevant, I'm gonna learn some of that stuff and keep doing that. So that's, that's the excitement of what I think of staying young. As long as I keep learning, that's the youth. I, I tell people, I found the fountain of youth. The fountain of youth is always being a constant learner. That's how you're going to see The music that. will keep you young. I mean, I, I am, my fountain of youth is you guys uh, being older than me, but still invigorating me with your spirit more than anything else. I mean, the, the idea of separating uh, just when, I don't even think about uh, in a lesson context, but just, I just want you to riff on the idea of separating technique from just the playing the song, uh, you know, it's really it's, in, yeah. important yeah. because we're saturated with material now. We talked about some very successful YouTube channels that are fostering techniques and opportunities for kids to see how to play certain types of rhythms, but that's just a technique and it's a tool Absolutely. as opposed to playing the song. Absolutely. So what is the prescient way? How do you split that difference? How do you create that balance? This is a great question, Jake. I think what, first of all, what happens is that the, the tool is not the main focus of, of what it's about. For example, I like to work in my house, I built the studio. No one comes into the studio and says, boy, Dom, look at that crown molding, look at how beautiful that looks. Boy, you know how you did that framing around that door. Nobody, nobody ever says that to me. Right, Okay. right. What, they, what person, a person might come in and say, wow, this studio, boy, it feels good in here, it's a good feeling. So no one ever walks in my house and compliments my hammer. Boy, Don, I'm looking at your home here. You must have a great hammer. Can I see your hammer? It's just a tool. It's just, it's, it's, I don't even think of the hammer. What I produce is what's important. So again, when I teach about these different techniques, we have to get these techniques so ingrained in your system that we're not thinking about it. Real quick, Jake, there's yeah. four different steps of learning. The first step is unconscious incompetence. Unconscious incompetence means I come to play the instrument, I've never taken a lesson, I don't know anything about drums, I grab the sticks incorrectly and just start playing, but I'm having fun and I'm just bashing. And I'm killing myself playing, but it's really... really Unconscious fun. incompetence. Unconscious, I think I love that line. Okay. Unconscious incompetence means you're not aware that you stink. That's what that means. Okay. You're not aware that you're bad. That's all right. You're having fun. That's good. Then what happens, you hear another drummer... That's got some chops, that's got some, he's smooth, he's got some good time, he's got some good technique, and all of a sudden you realize, well, I gotta learn that. So now that becomes conscious incompetence. Dig, right with you. I'm now, right with you, you're man. you're aware that you suck, okay, is what it comes out. And you don't wanna get self conscious, right? You you're just conscious incompetence. Conscious, now it's conscious incompetence. I am now aware that there's information out there for me to learn. Then you go to stage three. There's only four stages. Stage three is now, Conscious competence. Conscious competence is now, 
I am aware of what I have to learn. So I begin to practice these techniques. So whether it's a, whether it's a finger technique with my left hand, whether it's a, a, a rebound technique, which is the free soak George Lawrence Stone, or whether it's a molar motion, where I want a strong backbeat, totally relaxed, no calluses on my hands, I'm totally comfortable, I'm not thinking of that technique, but I had to consciously learn that technique. So stage three is conscious competence. You're learning the structures and the fundamentals. The ultimate is stage four, Yeah. unconscious competence. Now, these techniques are so ingrained in my system, I'm not thinking of... I love this stuff. I'm not thinking of even hand positions. In match grip, we have German position, which is a, which is a stick is at a 90 degree angle. We have American position where the stick is at a 45 degree angle, and then we have the French grip where the sticks are parallel and my thumb's on top. Now why that's important is because I might be playing French grip on my hi-hat, I'm playing open-handed now, I might be playing French grip here while I'm playing Germanic grip here. So I'm mixing these two positions. I'm not thinking of this in the lesson, in, the, in stage three, conscious competence, we're studying it. When you get this so ingrained to unconscious competence, you just express it. And is that st stage four only on the bandstand? That, when you're on the bandstand, you don't think of any of this. It's just, Charlie Parker said, when you're practicing at home, practice every scale, every rhythm, practice. Listen to everything on the radio. Analyze and, it, and, analyze it, everything. Right. And then when you get to the bandstand, forget it all. Just Go and serve the I music. love that line, dude. Okay? That was Charlie Parker. So now, at this point now, yeah. if I'm playing from my wrist in French grip, I'm playing George Lawrence Stone's free stroke, the rebound, from my wrist. But in my right hand, I'm playing Germanic position, molar. So that would sound like this. I'm not thinking of French and German and George Lawrence Stone and more. That's got to get so ingrained. So stage three, conscious competence, and stage four, unconscious competence, that's where you're going to keep on going around. Because even a person who's at stage four still jumps back to stage three to learn. The great Vinny Kaliuta. I'm with Vinny at the NAMM show recently in 2019. We did a panel session together. There were Several thousand people that were there was amazing. And while I'm walking there, Vinny says, um, he goes, Fab, are there any, any books out there that, I, I, that might challenge me that are out there? Right. I said, boy, it's funny I mentioned that. I was just with a student of mine, Klaus Hessler, who wrote a book, Camp Duty Update, that's a, it's got like Swiss rudiments, and it's really, it really challenged me. And I'm, I'm working on the book, and it really is kind of you know, bringing me back to that learning process. So Vinny goes, oh man, can you get me a copy? I called up Klaus, got a copy, mailed it to Vinny. So that to me, that's- He's going back to stage three. He's going back to stage three. That's the power yeah. of being a constant learner. That's where youth is, to keep yourself fresh and on top of what's happening, to keep on learning. So I believe that those four stages of those different diagrams, I'll send you a diagram that you can, you can pop up in the, and share with the students. Of course. It has that stage one, two, three, four. Now, think about this as far as language. When I'm speaking, I'm not thinking, of the letters of the alphabet. I'm not thinking of consonants you know, you know, and, and, and vowels. I'm not thinking of nouns and prepositions. I have learned all that. It's unconsciously competent. It's in my soul of speaking. And when I speak, I use them well. Sometimes I say to certain students when I'm speaking about the, the language part of it, conjunctions, name me five conjunctions. And they look at me like I, I, I have no idea. Although they use them well, conjunctions connect Two ideas in a sentence. And, but, or, for, nor, those are conjunctions. So if I say, I'm going to go to the store, but I have to pick up my sister first. It lets me put two different concepts and ideas together in one sentence. Uh. That's a conjunction, very important. Now, we don't remember what conjunctions are, but we use them. That's unconscious competence. That's where we want to get with this issue. So we're not thinking about it. So when someone comes to me who wants to learn techniques, when we speak about techniques, I tell them we're going to speak about these techniques just so you can get it to a point where you can ingrain this into your system so when you play, you're not thinking about it. 
That's the journey. How many people, how, truthfully, maybe maybe it'll surprise me, but in your travels, Greece, uh, you know, all the different continents, how many cats get an, a chance to play consistently in that unconscious step four mode? Because to me, uh, there were so many gigs to go around and people were just always, everybody was helping each other out back when you were coming up. Yeah, everybody yeah. had their own path. Yeah, yeah. All right, Herb Bushler had his own path. Steve Gadd had his own path. You had your own path. Yeah. But there was so much work to go around. And so that fourth step, unconscious competence, competence yeah. is that still, do cats still have that opportunity today as opposed to just getting, working constantly on the rudiments because they don't have, the, the gigs aren't there. I'm just curious about in the world because jazz, this is a world music now. Great point. And, and the answer is there are not as many that we witnessed years ago because years ago it was really more, it was totally about the music. And anyone that, is, that, is, that has a certain level of maturity knows it's only about the music. Sometimes what I see in younger players, it's more about the fame and to be famous and to be noticed, to have more likes on social media, to have more followers. Analytics. That, 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 when I hear this, this, this concept of the, of the analytics or the, or the, you know, the, 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 the statistics. The views. Like, the, the, yeah. Man, that, that stuff is totally irrelevant to what's happening. Well, when that becomes too important right. for, for musicians to play cover songs so they can get people to watch them and get a million views, and that all of a sudden now they, they've got fame. Listen, if that's what you're, what makes you happy, great and do it. But if, is, is that really serving the music? Then that, that's, that's where I have that, that, that concern. You know, you made a great point. Uh, we can go through it all, all the decades, but I'm, I'm curious. Dom Fumilaro is having a very hard time, and for anybody in the audience, because you have bushels of fans chiming in here you are unable and maybe it's kind of a good thing that you can't label the these last two decades of music yeah. but everything that we've talked about even off air as it relates to dixieland and ragtime and swing and big band that was all the the, the, the changes in the music came from rhythm Absolutely. and now we're look we're in a time of of essentially quantized rhythm i mean there's plenty of cats carmen and torre people like that just brilliant brilliant drummers yeah. But the, the, the technology now has quantized the music. It's very vertical. Mm. Is, do you think that's the reason you can't peg the, the music? Because it's just, uh, I don't know what yeah. the right word is, but it's, it's not that bouncing ball anymore. I, I talked about this, what you referred to. In the, in the early uh, 19th, from 1900 to 1910, you know, it was Dixieland music. That decade was defined for Dixieland. Next decade, 1910 to 1920, was ragtime music. Music got a little faster, a little bit more complicated. From 1920 to 30 was the Charleston or the... The, the, the Roaring Twenties. The Roaring Twenties excitement, which the music got faster and dance became more crazier with them you know, changing their knees back and forth and dancing. That became more exciting. 1930 started swing music. That's when Krupa kind of hit the scene with Benny Goodman and the, the, the quartet. 1940, big band music hit the scene. So the 1940 decade had all of them, you know, Basie and Ellington and Stan Kenton and, and, and all these great big bands that were hitting the scene that were touring. It was incredible. 1950 became bebop jazz and hillbilly music when Elvis entered. Now, hillbilly music was, was a, a kind of music where it was kind of a simpler, folky kind of a sound of what they were doing. Elvis opened up the world. Johnny Cash kind of stuff, too. Cash, all that stuff was happening. But also at that time in the 50s, bebop had started. And what was happening? Charlie Parker, these guys were really, you know, dizzy. They, Miles, they were really kind of hitting and opening some doors. 1960s hits, jazz now has its own direction of what it's doing. But in the 60s, we get the British invasion. Now we got the Beatles, we got Zeppelin, we got the Who. We got all these bands coming in that are playing fantastic music. 1970s hits, and what do we have? Tower of Power, Earthland and Fire, Chicago, Blood, Sweat and Tears, Stevie Wonder, all these bands that come in now with horn sections, with their music, that's fantastic in the 70s. The 80s hits, it's long-haired rock. That comes in, the metal started, was kind of excited of what that was. The 90s hits, we begin hip-hop and grunge, very clear what it was. We get to the year 2000, and for me, it stops. Can If anybody out there wants to start to chime in with what they feel the, the music of the last... Deck to go help. ahead because it please, stopped now. And when you when you when you're up at night or <clears throat> at five in the morning playing the piano and and just hearing that big band behind you and you stop, why do you 
think that you can't? Why do you think it's imp- it's hard for you to to, lab- to find it? Uh, well, because when I listen to music now, I don't. I, I can't. For instance, I can't. How would you define two thousand to two thousand ten? How would we define that decade? It's a decade of music. I can't grab what defines that decade. That's why these tribute bands, when they go back to the 20th century, they're playing music of the 60s, of the 70s, of the 80s. They go back and they, they find these bands that, are, that they're tributing to to keep that music. Relentlessly. Uh, incredible. So now 2010 to 2019, we're almost finishing the second decade of the 21st century, and I still can't define it. So in these 20 years now that we're approaching on in the 21st century, please help me define what it is. If we can't define it, then all of you musicians that are out there have to go back and go back to conscious competence and learn what it takes to have the foundation to really play music in an emotional message that can move people that can now start to define the message of what this 21st century is. Well, here's the heavy, here's a heavy question for you because I think, I think I just something popped into my head. The journalists like myself were the ones that were labeling this music, okay? Uh, I, I guess P- Dizzy called his music bebop. I, I'm, you know, that's still up in the air about that stuff. But yeah. uh, how has the significance of music changed in our culture, Dom? Well, because maybe that's the reason. Because maybe the, the, maybe the music that we're all talking about had the serious significance to the vitality of the culture. Always music dictates the, t- the sign of the times, always. So we have to question, what are the sign of the times now in the 21st century? How divisive are How people pol- now is exactly. in, in the world of politics? Let's just take America, for example. I have never in my lifetime of 65 years, and I lived through the, I was born in the 50s, I lived through the 60s and, and all the way through, I have never seen a divisiveness of people angry at each other because of a different opinion. I love different opinions. We're not enemies. We're not, I mean, we're not enemies. We're in the same, we're in the same boat and we're in the same boat trying to survive and people are fighting in that boat, helping to sink the boat. You got a question. Why are you doing that? Is it, is it ego? Well, because they just feel like their, whatever their point of view is, is so important and they're not, and it's, and it's either, they feel it's, it's not winning out, which is not really what it's about. Right. And what I call this, what I, what I have labeled this in my terminology is is it's, it's kind of like a, it's like an intoxicated righteousness. Is that the, is that the, is that the music of this century? Well, it, it, I mean, into- I am right and you can't rationalize, but I'm right and this is what I'm doing. So I think what's happening with, wow. it starts with, with frame of mind and then when they compose music, is the music being composed for the betterment of the bigger picture or is it because they're just trying to prove themselves right? In discussions about politics or religion, it's I'm right, you're wrong, as opposed to let's see if we can come to terms or we can agree to disagree, but I still love you as a person. We don't really have a lot of that happening right now. But the brilliance about that is go back and watch some George Carlin. <laughs> Listen to his. Well, I mean, the guy, he, he, you know, the greatest thing, and that's, and you bring up a good point because Carlin used to open for uh, uh, Lifetime. Absolutely. I, I mean, and then there'd be certain points where like they'd have to, like Tony or Williams or. Or 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 McLaughlin would be like, you know, George, you got to get off because they were the people were laughing too hard. Yeah. So there, it was also the the, the multi dimensional component of of entertainment as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I also feel people are dug in in their values. Where someone like Coltrane, I mean, I just spent some time with Odin Pope, who's the most legendary horn player in Philly. Practiced with Hassan and Al, Ab, uh, Hassan and, and Coltrane every day. Three hours train would practice scales. Yeah. But truthfully, I think Coltrane's message was. He wanted to create peace yeah. amongst all people, absolutely, all uh, who believe in all deities, and 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 I think that that was the significance of spiritual music, it's and fun. and that's why I'm just trying to figure out, you know, yeah. like I'm, I'm one, I think yeah. I think I think one reason it's hard to to peg this time is because not only is there a homogenization of sound and a reliance on all this technology, but it's also the fact that people are trying to pull in their direction, their religious direction, or their what they believe is right, as yeah. opposed to just a world belief of, of uh, a revolution of consciousness. Absolutely. I had the chance of living here on Long Island to play with a great saxophone player. I was 14 years old when I started playing with him. His name is Pat DeRosa. Pat DeRosa was a great, great jazz saxophone player. He's still around at 97, still playing gigs here on Long Island. He's a brilliant player. When they say old school, 
man, he, he wrote the book for old school. It's just so much fun to play with him because you just, you just know that every note that he plays is heartfully felt. Well, Pat was also a, a high school teacher at Huntington School District. And Coltrane lived in Dix Hills here on Long Island. That's right. And Pat said, when Coltrane had found out how well that Pat had played, he called up Pat and said, I'd like you to do some practice sessions with me. I'm reading you know, sax duets. I want someone to do duets with me. So after he would teach Huntington High School, he would drive to Dix Hills to go to Coltrane's house, <laughs> and, they would, and Coltrane would have tons of books out, and they would practice duets together. And Pat said, we played, and we just read, and we just did it, and they went over and over certain parts. They would do it for like a couple of hours, then they'd have dinner together, then Pat would go home and go teach the next day, and Coltrane would then continue with his jazz gig. The Coltrane happens to be buried here on Long Island in Huntington. Are you kidding me? I'm going to go see the grave today. Grave. Are you kidding me? The grave site is here in Huntington. Oh, You've got to go check it out for sure. It's a fantastic tribute to this great man. They recently found his old house. The developers were going to take it down, and now they're turning it into a museum. So it's The Church of Coltrane. <coughs> Jeez. So, so, but no, but the, 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 the point there with DeRosa and Train, the collaboration was there. And what did Coltrane do? He went to stage three... Conscious competence. I'm going to keep on learning so I can ingrain this newer stuff into my system so I can have it unconsciously when I get to the bandstand. That's the, that's the greatest lesson that all of us have to learn. There's an open-mindedness that you're oh, talking about. That's the, and the, clo the closed-mindedness of this time is pervasive, and it's, not, it's insidious. Uh, um, I wanted to ask you about one thing. Um, uh, I, I had the, the, the privilege of going to see some really amazing younger cats in New York City play in uh, Bed-Stuy and... Um, it was interesting. They had a four-piece rhythm section. The guitar player w was an, is an amazing soloist, but he was playing these just not even Freddie Green, but more of in a funk context: drums, bass, and piano. And I wonder what you think about: the, is it a loss? Is the four-piece rhythm section a lost art today? Basie had it too, yeah, yeah. and that foundation allowed, as Ron Carter would say those soloists to bring their kitchen solos to the table because the foundation was so deep. Yeah. You don't hear a lot of rhythm guitar anymore. You know, and interesting you mentioned Basie. Uh, I got a chance to spend a, a couple of times talking to Freddie Green. You did? Yes, I did. And I used to go hear the Basie band, and Basie sometimes would be on, on the stage with Buddy Rich. I had a chance to go hear Buddy and be backstage. Oh, that's unreal. With, with Buddy. And when Freddie Green was there, he played acoustic guitar in a, in a, in a big band. Unamplified? Unamplified. Unamplified acoustic Unamplified guitar. Acoustic it was guitar. not in an amp. Not in an amp. And what he did was, and I used to ask him, I said, Freddie, how do, it's hard to hear you. <laughs> so he said, well, it's not my job for you to hear me. It's my job for the rhythm section to hear me. That's, he just wanted to keep time and playing so the rhythm section felt good. If the rhythm section felt good, the band felt good. If the band felt good, the people felt good. So Freddie's focus was not to have everybody acknowledge Freddie Green. People don't even know Freddie Green when you think about it. The, the, the cats do, but not enough of, pe of the peeps People do. You know? They weren't concerned about the fame. That's why I go back to what's happening in today's world. Today's world, the focus is the fame. It wasn't the focus years ago. It was the purpose and cause of the team effort to make the music great. So you went out and inspired people and lifted them from their seats. So when they left the concert, you felt a better person because you heard this fantastic music that just felt good. We don't always have that happening as their goal. The goal is to go out and fire them up and you know, get more likes and get more social media. And get more. So I, there's a difference in, in, in what the purpose is now of music. And I, I go back, the rhythm section is, will never lose the rhythm section because that's always the, the core and heartbeat of the band. And I, I, you know, it's funny, when I set my drums up, I have a 12 inch and a 16 inch here and a 10 and 14. Right. Well, most people put the 10 inch here the 12 and the 14 here and the 16 here. Well, when I started playing drums with a, with a, with a rhythm section, I played a four piece kit. I played a snare drum, a 12 inch tom here, and a 16 inch floor tom here, and a ride cymbal, and a crash. And that's how we played that 12 and 16 here. So when, when everything evolved and changed, and people started putting their 10 inch here, I didn't want that. I wanted my 12 and my 16 to stay in the original four piece fashion. So when I look at my drum set, I still see a four piece kit with an old school four piece feel. Dig! And the 10 and the 14 are added to the effect 
not taking away from the core of my of my of my kid. So to me, that that was a major. Were you in the studio in New York? Did you did you have a favorite rhythm guitar player you played with, like like uh, Barry Galbraith or? or well, I, I, I mean, because I mean that's to me also like like what Freddie was like what Harold. I've interviewed Harold Jones a couple times, and yeah. he's still playing his ass off with Tony Bennett. Yeah. Uh, Harold said you could, it was like having your cake and eating it too with oh, Freddie. Yeah. And, and Harold is still legend. Still on fire. Cust of play, cust of playing. Playing great, doing fan, 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 just fantastic things. I had the chance of working with Steve Steve Kahn a couple times. Oh yeah, Steve, 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 Steve. and also um, who recently passed away, whose name I just forgot. Um, the guitar player, oh man, jazz guitar player. He just passed. He, he, he passed away about a year or so ago. Young guy. <coughs> came, um, It'll come to you. I, I can't believe I, I forget, but another great, great player that was just you, know, you walked in in any style, any sound, and they'd come in with a, a couple different guitars. To get the kind of sound that they needed, you know, it, was, it was. I mean, sometimes they come in with a Diacristo or right. you know, you know, a D'Angelico guitar, or they come in with a Fender. It was amazing to see that they came in with these cases and opened it up and just fantastic, fantastic players. Do you, it, it helps? Do you think it, it helps the drummer too? I mean, in in some ways, I, I just what I'm saying is we look at we're, we're saturated with material. People are obsessed with facility and chops, mm. so it's almost like not vogue. It's not hip to play rhythm. But actually, it is the hippest thing in the it, world. It, it not only is the hippest thing, but listen, even drum and bass, whatever they're doing, it's still about the rhythm and the feel. That's what's going to, you know. The vibration, yeah. The vibration and feel of that, of that tune, that's going to be laid down first. Whatever melody or chord structure is on top of that or whatever the form of the song is, that's all built on top of that initial feel. That will, I think that just human element, we have a heartbeat, we have blood flowing through our body, there's a rhythm that we breathe all of that, to me, is the rhythm of what is being played from music. And I think that's what connects with people first. Before I let you go, Dom, it's always great to see you, man. Um, I, you know, we talked about it in one of our radio interviews, but for people that are going to watch this today, next week, or in 10 years, I want you to speak to your generation. You said very eloquently last time to me, um, it's great to go out and perform. And it's great to go out on tour and, and play the hits and play the tunes the audience wants to see and make a livelihood out of that. And if you think that, that if that's your, been your contribution to music, that's fantastic. It really is, yeah. Tell, talk to your generation about the fact that they need to, how they can go farther in, in contributing to the cycle of music. We, we um, I'm, I'm 65, so, you know, and people watching this, and I've got a little humble career, I do my thing. I'm Absolutely. Thankful, I'm thankful for still being involved with music and doing what I do. So You I, get up every day and scream that you have a new day it, of life. It, I mean, it, it really is, and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm humbled by that, and I'm thankful for that. I work hard for it, you know, and, and as my wife does, and assisting me to make all this stuff happen. I think what's interesting about it is that I realize now at 65, if I don't take the responsibility of trying to pass this on to this next generation, then I am a part of the challenge and the problem. I'm not passing this on. I can't assume they know. When I go to a, and a young drummer and he, and he doesn't know who Steve Gadd is, I can't get angry at them. What I gotta do is kinda open their mind and share what they can do to research and how to be inspired by Steve Gadd. And whenever I do that and they do the research, they always contact me back by saying, my gosh, I had no idea. Yeah, they had no idea. So sometimes having no idea doesn't mean that what is that you don't know about is bad. It means what you don't know about, you don't know or about. You ha or it's your job to enlighten them instead of yelling at I them. I have to now take the responsibility of sharing this to open up their mind and right. give them some of the feedback. And it's not always about what happened in the past. It's about how times are changing. And I've got to remain open-minded, open-minded. I've got an open mind to take in this change. I might not agree with the change, but I want to adapt to it so I stay relevant to what's happening in today's time. So I have to have that, that core calling and responsibility to share this information with this next generation, fire them up, and let them feel the magic that we felt. And then I teach them in that process that when you get a little older, you then have to pass it on. That's the cycle that's complete. It was passed on for me when I used to sit back with Philly Joe Jones backstage and he would open up the Charlie Wilcox and drum book and play on a pad. He'd give me a pair of sticks and I'd play on the pad with him. <laughs> Papa, you know, Joe Jones was playing, he's playing, and he played the page flawlessly. I made a freaking million mistakes and we would laugh hysterically. And that's what was his warm up before I went on stage to play jazz. It was just so great. So he stayed open minded to new ideas and new books. 
gosh, that to me is like such a great message and I hope that I can pass that message on. And I want people that are now more mature of their playing career to give back. Because they're giving what are they, back. I just real quick, I mean, because I, I love the idea of exposing people to to, to cats and, 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 you know, like Gad. Are there other ways that you... Um, I mean, like the like. Let's be very fair. It's not. Unfortunately, we're taking a year off from Mesa, but the the, the Cobham Rhythm Retreat, which is going to go go on at Sweetwater in yeah. Indiana, <coughs> you you guys lose money on that. Oh, I mean, I mean, that's what I'm saying. It's not the greed factor is so high now, and I, and I mean, it, it yeah. people are blinded by it. They're not even aware of it. It's not about the money at all. It's about with the Billy Cobham Rhythm, you know, section retreat, BillyCobhamRetreat.com. We, we do it, we did it in Arizona, we, we're pausing in Arizona, we're gonna to go to Sweetwater in Indianapolis, uh, or Indiana, some, somewhere where Sweetwater is located, and we're gonna do it there in October, the 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th. And it's about bringing all musicians together, guitar players, bass players, keyboard players, and, and, and drummers, and, and, and wind players, to get together, and they all play together for an entire week. So we put this together, and we put you in situations to learn. It's such an inspiring, lifting week of playing music. It's not just, it's not a drum camp, although I love the drum camps, it's a music camp. Absolutely. And you're playing music. The art being, of music. And you're being challenged. You know, there might be a feel that you might not sure you can do, but they put you in that situation, and believe it or not, you end up rising to the level to learn that. It's such a great growing experience. So that's a very important part of the process. And playing music and being able to challenge yourself, this to me is what the gift of learning is. If I can challenge myself to get out of my comfort zone, you know, from your comfort zone, you go into the next zone is the fear zone. You're afraid when you step out of your comfort zone. Then you get into the learning zone. Also, now you're learning, and then you get into the growth zone. Where also you grow. So there's four you're... zones as well. Four zones as well, absolutely. And, and and when you're in that growth zone, where also now you've taken this information in, and it's that unconscious competence where you're getting it. What did you just do? You just widened your comfort zone. So the object is to keep widening that comfort zone and grow and challenge yourself, challenge others, and play music for the purpose of being able to. Speak a language that can inspire people to aspire. That, to me, is just so powerful. Dom, thank you for being a supporter of my program. My first book will be coming out at the end of the month. The second book is, the, is going to be The Calling, and I, I can't thank you enough. People had a ball listening to this. and uh, if, if, you know, if anybody wants to take a shot at, the, at, at uh, labeling music from the last couple of decades, yeah, please we're do. all ears, man. Please do. And thank you so much, Jake. What you do is fantastic. You bring us all together, and you allow all of our voice to be heard. For that, Jake, I thank you so much. Love always. This Thanks. is the Jake Feinberg Show. We'll see you later. <laughs>